The Peter Schiff Show. I'm recording today's podcast from my hotel room here in Las Vegas. I came out here to do both the Vegas Money Show and the SALT Conference. And normally when I'm out of town and I do one of these recordings, I just record it straight into my laptop and use the laptop mic. And a lot of you have been complaining about the audio quality. So I went out and purchased a new mic that I have plugged in uh, to my MacBook Air. So hopefully this has in, will improve the quality. And so the people that are typically commenting about the poor sound quality won't be doing it this time. But it just shows you I read the comments and I do listen. Today, though, I really want to talk more about Donald Trump, in particular, the firestorm that I think I lit with respect to Trump comments about defaulting on the national debt. Now, I really believe that I am the first guy to have picked up on that because when he originally talked about that on CNBC and Becky Quick kind of said, wait a minute, are you talking about you know our credit rating, compromises on the credit rating? That's when Donald Trump said, no, 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 I'm not talking about defaulting. I'm talking about restructuring, refinancing was what he said. I'm talking about refinancing. And Becky Quick just kind of let it go. She accepted the explanation. And nobody else that was on CNBC at the time said anything. And later that day, I was contacted by CNBC. I had already agreed to do Futures Now on CNBC.com to talk about Trump, kind of in reaction to the article I had written uh, at the end of last week on Donald Trump and you know how Donald Trump could make America great again. And so they wanted me to talk about it. And I said, hey, wait a minute, why don't we also talk about his comments today about defaulting on the debt? And the producer said, what are you talking about? What comments? So I went and described what he said. And I said, look, go get the clip and you know we'll talk about it on the program. So she had no idea that Trump had said anything like this. So I don't know if anybody was talking about it, and I didn't read anything about it. I mean, I tweeted about it in real time. As soon as I heard Trump say that, I I sent out a tweet. He was still in the studio talking when my tweet was out there. But I really didn't read anything about this until well after my CNBC interview took place. And, of course, then there were articles about it, and lots of people, even the New York Times, wrote a big article about it. In fact, so much was written about it that Donald Trump then had to officially respond to the idea that he said he wanted to default on the debt, which, of course, he never actually did. I admitted that I said that. He never actually said it, but it's clear to me that that is exactly what he meant. It wasn't like he was just implying it. That's what he was thinking. I could tell as he was talking that is 100% what was on his mind. But the thing is, Donald Trump is not a career politician. He's new to politics, and so he's not always thinking about the political ramifications of just speaking off the cuff and, and talking honestly, which is what he was doing. But all of a sudden, when he put his presidential candidate hat back on, when Becky Quick called him out, and all of a sudden he had a chance to process what he just inadvertently let slip, then he backtracked. And I think it would have died right there had it not been for me. Now, of course, Donald Trump doesn't want to be the candidate advocating default. I mean, even though we can't possibly repay this debt, I guess there are some truths that even Donald Trump is afraid to utter when you're running for president. So he immediately started to backtrack. But I want to talk about why his explanation makes no sense at all. And to me, it shows that I was 100% right about what he was thinking. And all he's doing now is spin. He's trying to cover it up because he doesn't want to deal with the genie that he just inadvertently let out of the bottle. Now, I think the press in general, will probably accept his explanation because, you know, they don't really know very much. But let's go into it. First of all, he said, of course, we're not going to default on the debt. Why would we default? We print the money. And so we never have to default. We can print the money. Now, when he was talking about the debt, he wasn't talking about printing money. Not at all. In fact, if anything, he acknowledged that printing money would be a problem because he said, look, you know, We have to keep interest rates low, but if inflation picks up, we got a real problem. Yes, because then we have to raise interest rates. 
So it seemed to me that he was thinking that printing money would be a problem, but as long as these official uh, interest rates or official inflation rates are low, we can avoid uh, having to raise rates. But the context with which Donald Trump was speaking about the debt, he was talking about his experience with debt. He is the king of debt. He knows how to handle debt. He knows how to play with debt. And therefore, we should elect him as opposed to, let's say, Hillary Clinton that doesn't have any experience with getting out of debt. Donald Trump has a lot of experience with debt. He's borrowed a lot of money. Some of it he's repaid. A lot of it he hasn't. And he's gotten into situations where he's been able to negotiate and lower his debt, get the people who loaned him money to accept less than what uh, they initially loaned as repayment in full. That's what he was talking about. Now, if he was simply talking about printing money, that wouldn't make any sense. Donald Trump has no experience printing money. He's never owned a printing press. In fact, if he did, he never would have had to take any of his companies into bankruptcy. If Donald Trump could just print money, you know, he, he, he'd be a lot richer than he is now. He'd probably be as rich as he claims to be, even richer, right? I mean, if you could print money, you never have to default. You don't have to be the king of debt if you're the king of the printing press. So Donald Trump has no experience printing money. So if his solution to the debt problem is to print money, then why is he any more qualified than anybody else? Let's just make Ben Bernanke president, right? He's the big money printer. He's the king of money printing. What, you know, Donald Trump's not the king of that. So clearly, when he was using his experience with debt as the reason why we should elect him, because he can figure out how to get us out of this problem because he has experience doing it. What is his experience when you have too much debt? You don't repay in full. You get your your lenders to accept less. You restructure, you negotiate. That's exactly what he was talking about. And of course, he's trying to bring his private sector experience to bear in the public sector. But he has no private sector experience printing money. Clearly, that's not what he meant. But obviously, once everybody started talking about default, and doesn't Donald Trump know we can print money? Obviously, we don't have to default. And so he, you know, he answered his critics by saying, well, of course we know we can print money. I'm not a fool. So of course we're not going to default. We could print money. That is not what he meant. And of course, what nobody wants to talk about is printing money is default only worse. See, default is honest. Printing money is dishonest. When you default... You tell your creditors, we're not going to pay you in full. When you print, you lie to your creditors. You pretend that you're going to pay them in full, but then you don't. You print a bunch of money, and so what you end up paying them is not worth anywhere near what they loaned you. So that is still a method of default. And by the way, if our creditors believed that we were going to print money instead of defaulting, then they wouldn't want to lend us any more money. It's the idea that we're going to repay is why they keep loaning us money, because they believe they're going to get repaid, not through a printing press, but through America's ability to tax its citizens and repay in real money. But that's not going to happen. We can't raise taxes. In fact, Donald Trump is talking about lowering taxes. The only other way that we can pay legitimately is to prioritize are creditors over American citizens who have been promised benefits like Social Security or Medicare or pensions for either government workers or retired military, the veterans. But Donald Trump isn't talking about cuts for vets. He wants to spend more on vets. He's not talking about cutting uh, money from Social Security. He wants to leave Social Security untouched. So what could he possibly be talking about other than a restructuring or default? That's what he meant. But politically, he couldn't own that. And so he had to make up some excuse. And he's saying, well, I was referring to printing money. No, he was not. Just listen to that CNBC interview. It was the furthest thing from his mind, printing money. Now, the second excuse that he's making up is that when he talked about refinancing the debt or renegotiating, he was talking about taking advantage of the fact that when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And what he's talking about is buying back that debt at a discount. So not forcing people to take less, but just taking advantage of a depressed market. For example, let's say that you were dumb enough to buy a U.S. Treasury bond, a 30-year Treasury bond that was paying, you know, 2.5%. And all of a sudden, interest rates spike up, and now interest rates are 10%, right? And you're stuck 
with a two and a half percent coupon for the next, you know, say 25 years. What is that bond worth? It's not worth a hundred cents on the dollar. It probably, maybe it's worth 30 or 40 cents. I don't know. I'm not, I don't have a bond calculator in front of me. I'm not getting the exact number. But obviously, if the market bonds, if you buy a brand new bond that it's paying 10% and you're trying to sell a bond that only yields two or two and a half, whatever percent, you're going to have to sell it at a discount. And so what Donald Trump was talking about is buying at the discount, take advantage of depressed bond prices and go out and buy bonds. That is not what he was thinking about because that is impossible. Number one, the vast majority of the national debt is financed short term, right? Most, I think like a third of the debt probably matures in the next year. So if you have short term bonds, those bonds don't go to a discount. You just wait for them to mature and the government has to repay in full. And, and so it's only the, the real long term bonds that are going to be at a sharp discount. But most of the bonds that are really long term are not the ones that people own. You know who owns those real long-term bonds? The Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, through Operation Twist and QE, the Fed owns all those long-term bonds. And I guess the uh, Treasury, assuming it had the money, which it does, and I'll get to that in a minute, but if the Treasury bought back the bonds from the Fed at a discount, the Fed would lose a fortune. And guess who's on the hook for those losses? The United States Treasury. You see, any money that the, that the Federal Reserve loses... On its assets, it's four and a half trillion dollars on its balance sheet. If the Federal Reserve actually sells any bonds at a loss, by law, that loss is a bill that it sends to the government, Congress or the Treasury to repay. So let's assume that Donald Trump was able to buy back a couple of trillion dollars from the Treasury for 50 cents on the dollar, right? So maybe he bought $2 trillion of the treasuries for $1 trillion. Well, now the, he would just have to give the $1 trillion right back to the Fed because the Fed would lose a trillion and it would send the bill back to the treasury. So the only debt that theoretically Trump would, would be able to buy back at a discount would be the debt that was not held by the Federal Reserve, the Fed that was held, the debt that was held by private citizens or by foreign central banks, but most of that debt is short term and they're not going to be dumb enough to sell it at a discount to Donald Trump when all they have to do is let it mature and they get paid in full. But of course, the other reason why this whole thing is ridiculous is where would the government get the money to repay or to buy back the debt? So let's say the national debt is 20 trillion and interest rates spike up maybe 10% so that the bonds are trading for 50, 60 cents on the dollar. So let's say Donald Trump wants to buy back $5 trillion worth of debt and only wants to pay $3.5 trillion. Okay, where's he going to get the $3.5 trillion? They don't have it. In fact, we're going to have to repay all the short-term debt that is maturing. So how can we repay the debt that's maturing, which is trillions and trillions of dollars, and then come up with trillions more to buy back all this debt at a discount. It is impossible. The whole scenario doesn't even make sense. Donald Trump hasn't even thought this through. He's just trying to spin his way out of this. He's trying to take his foot out of his mouth. But again, the media is so clueless about the national debt and how it works that they can't even figure out how ridiculous what he's saying actually is. And also think about what would be going on in the U.S. economy, assuming interest rates really spiked up so that U.S. Treasury bond prices collapsed to the point where, you know, Trump could try to buy them in the market at a discount, assuming the government had the money, which is impossible. But imagine what would happen to the U.S. economy under those circumstances, right? The real estate market would crash. The banks would crash. The government would have to bail out Fannie and Freddie. The government would have to bail out all the banks that were failing. So where's the government going to get all the money to bail out the banks, to bail out Fannie and Freddie, also to bail out the pensions, and then have all this extra money to buy back all the debt? I mean, this is all fantasy land. Of course, the only place any of this money is going to come from is a printing press. So really, the whole idea of we're going to buy it back at a discount is impossible. See, the only thing that Donald Trump could have possibly meant when he talked about negotiations or getting a discount is telling our creditors, we're not going to pay you 100 cents on the dollar, not offer to pay them 50 cents on the dollar because we won't have any money to pay them. What we'd have to do is get them to agree to accept less over time because we have nothing now. But of course, this is the bottom line that nobody wants to admit 
that the U.S. is insolvent and paying off the debt is impossible because the lie that we can actually repay this debt or that we never have to repay the debt, which is even a bigger lie, is actually at the foundation of the entire global monetary system. And no one wants to admit that. And so Donald Trump inadvertently did. And of course, he immediately had to backtrack. Now, he's also been backtracking on some other statements. I, I saw an interview with Donald Trump on, on this week, on Sunday morning on ABC. And a couple of things that he made that, you know, where he's backtracking. One is he talked about his tax cuts and he, for the first time, said, look, yes, I submitted this huge tax cut, but it's really just an opening bid. It's an invitation to negotiate. I don't expect to actually get all these tax cuts or the, the size of the tax cuts. I'm just coming in low or maybe even lower than I want to be knowing that by the time it comes through Congress, I'm not going to get all this. Now, first of all, if that really is the strategy, why admit that now? Because you've just basically blown your whole negotiation. If you're telling everybody, hey, these are my numbers, but they're not really my numbers because I'm willing to take less. I mean, imagine if like you wanted to you wanted to you know, buy a house. Would Donald Trump do this and say, okay, yes, I'm will, or buy a piece of property. He's not really buying a pro house. Let's say Donald Trump says, yes, I want to, I I'll offer you $5 million, but you know, that's just my opening. I I'm willing to pay a lot more than that, but you know, just to get things going, I'm going to, I'm going to give you 5 million. Of course not. I mean, he's never going to get it. You have to pretend, look, I'm going to give you 5 million. This is it. This is my top offer. I'm not, gonna, I'm never going to go higher than that, right? You have to come in strong. So if Donald Trump goes to Congress and says, these are my tax rates that I'd like, but hey, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm open to, to anything else. I mean, obviously you, you have to start tough. He knows that. So now he's pretending that, you know, this is not really what I want. I, you know, I'm willing to settle for a lot less. That doesn't even make sense. That's not even something that Donald Trump would do. But then also, when the interviewer was talking to him about taxes on the rich, he actually said, well, you know, what I'm really concerned about is the middle class. I mean, they really need a break, right? So I want lower taxes for the middle class and lower taxes for business. But, you know, at the end of the day, when we get finished negotiating, the rich are probably going to pay more. And then I think the interviewer was kind of shocked. He said, well, you mean the rich are going to pay more? And he says, yes, you know, I wouldn't mind paying more in taxes. I mean, I've done really well. Other rich people have done really well. And so we wouldn't mind paying more. So he actually admitted now that he was willing to pay more. And he was starting to sound more like Bernie Sanders because, you know, he wants to get those Sanders votes. So he's talking about tax cuts for the middle class because they really could use it. And let's raise taxes on the rich because they've been doing so well. Now, of course, He's having to backtrack on that, and he's now saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't mean that the rich would have to pay higher taxes than they're paying now. I just meant higher than what I'm proposing. So, yes, I'm proposing a big tax cut for the rich, but I'm sure that by the end of the negotiations, the tax cut for the rich won't be as generous as the one that I first put in there. See, I think that's just spin. That's not what he meant, because if that's what he meant, he wouldn't have said, I'm okay paying more. Because what he's saying now, Donald Trump won't pay more. He'll pay less. He just said that he's willing to pay more and other rich people are willing to pay more. And now he's saying, no, 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 everybody's going to pay less. See, he's just making this stuff up. That is not what he was talking about when he was on that show. He was actually talking about raising taxes on the rich. But now all of a sudden, this was going to be another firestorm. So he had to quickly change course and come up with a believable excuse like, well, I only meant that they would pay more than what I'm proposing in my plan, but they would pay less than what they pay, what they're paying now. But if you listen to the entire interview and put it all in its proper context, that is not what he meant because then he wouldn't have said, I am willing to pay more. He didn't say, I'm going to pay less. I'm willing to pay a little bit more than this cut. So I'm willing to take a smaller cut. He said, I will pay more in taxes than I pay now. Not that I would pay under this plan. And he basically said that the rest of the wealthy people would also be willing to pay more. Now, there are some wealthy people that Donald Trump has always said would pay more, the hedge funds, because he wants to take away the carried interest. But this was the first time where, to me, he was talking about raising the top rate. That's what I, I heard when I heard him speak. But, of course, other people heard it, too. And so he had a backtrack. And then there was another thing that he backtracked about on this, and this is the minimum wage. Because when he was still in a tough fight for the Republican nomination, 
He was talking about, oh no, American workers are paid too much. That's part of the problem, right? We can't raise the minimum wage. We'll throw people out of work. That's what he was saying. He did not support a raise the minimum wage. Now, now he's saying, yes, I think the minimum wage should be higher. I think people deserve more. I don't know how you can live on seven twenty-five an hour. You know how you live on seven twenty-five an hour? You live with your parents. You have a bunch of roommates. That's how you live on it. Because these jobs are not designed to support a family. They're designed as entry-level jobs. It's unfortunate that so many people who are older that should have better jobs are having to settle for these crappy uh, minimum wage jobs. But raising the minimum wage isn't the solution. It'll just create a bigger problem. It'll just take away the crappy jobs, and so people will be left with no jobs. And Donald Trump obviously knows this, but now that he's in this general election, now that he's the presumptive nominee, and he wants to really tack to the center and appeal to the middle class, he's becoming a lot more... Um, Sander-esque. He's talking about taxing the rich. He's talking about the middle class. He's talking about people need a raise. We need to have a higher minimum. Now, he didn't say he was in favor of a higher federal minimum wage. He just said he wants the states to raise the minimum wage, which is already happening. But all of this, look, the minimum wage, look at the, the tax issue, and particularly look at the debt and the money printing. He is He, he, he talks, and then he realizes the political implications of what he says, and he changes his mind. Now, maybe he's a great politician. Maybe this is going to work. I mean, maybe this is the only way that he can get elected is to try to uh, take this tact. But he's got to hone his political skills because every once in a while he tries to speak honestly, and then he forgets about the fact that he's not just Trump the private citizen, but Trump the presidential candidate, which is one of the reasons that I have a lot of reservations about what he would actually do. Because I don't know if Trump the president is going to govern like Trump the candidate. I have absolutely no idea what he's going to do. But I do at least know one thing. He understands. He understands the problems in a way that he won't admit because he understands that admitting it might be political suicide. But the question is, does he understand the solutions? He knows what the problems are more than any other candidates, but does he understand the solutions? And is he willing to implement the solutions regardless of the political cost as far as a plunge in his popularity? Hey, let me talk a little bit now too on this podcast about the uh, big drop we had in the gold market today. Gold was down about 25 bucks. I think on the day closed around 1265. Silver was also down about 50 cents. The catalyst, I think, was a decline in the yen overnight. Some uh, dovish comments coming out of the, out of Bank of Japan that maybe they would, you know, if they had to, they would intervene in the currency markets if they if they needed to. They didn't actually say that they would, but just talking about the fact that they could is what sent the yen down. And you know that the gold has been pretty positively correlated with the yen. Now I don't think that's going to last forever. But it has been lasting in this risk-on, risk-off type of trade. Uh, gold has been going uh, with, with the yen. The other thing was I think there was some soft news out of China, which put some pressure on commodity price. I think the Chinese actually hinted that they wouldn't be doing much more in the way of stimulus. So I think that caused another pullback. You know, Remember, gold rallied on Friday in response to the weaker-than-expected um, jobs numbers, but it wasn't able to get through 1300 and I think that's also what caused uh, some profit-taking and some selling. But I still think that all we're doing here is consolidating the last move. I think we're biding time. We're building that wall of worry. We're shaking out a lot of weaker players with these huge moves down. The biggest moves are to the downside. Again, as I said on an earlier podcast, that is par for the course in a bull market. You shake everybody out. You create the wall of worry. The weak players uh, get out. And the people who have the conviction, the people that actually understand, ride it out. Because I think the bigger moves are coming to the upside. I think we're going a lot higher. But it isn't going to be easy. It's not going to be a straight line up. It never is. Right? The markets always make it difficult. The markets try to take as few people along the ride as possible. And so just don't get fooled out. Don't throw away a winning hand when you have one. Just stay until the end. And when you lay down your cards, <laughs> you're going to be the winner. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news. 
where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthandmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthandmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthandmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now, I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.